Okay, everybody. It's been a bit, hasn't it? We had a uh, midterm and had a holiday. And now we're back for a lesson. So uh, this lesson is scheduled for uh, 2-27-23, which is February 27-23, uh, second to last day of February. So we'll be in March before you know it, OK? So uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it, and we'll get back in the swing. And then before you know it, it'll be time for the final. I've been told that. Uh, we're only going to have nine weeks for this quarter, which is which is great for you guys to get off a little a week early. So I uh, just look forward to that. OK, so let me go to my usual procedure here and share the screen. Go to the material. Right. Start the slideshow. Then. Uh, Where's my beginning here? I hit the slideshow, I'm back on home. I usually start from the beginning. It's not giving me that, so let me fake it. Uh oh, I'm not doing that. This one. Okay. Start the slideshow. There we go. So again, if you've forgotten in the last two weeks, it's English 107, English composition and reading and week six. So like I said, we're only gonna go nine. So we had the holiday and then the midterm. So let's uh, proceed. Okay, the importance of organization. Humans like routine. And some even expect it so much that deviation from the routine can throw off an entire day. And that's true. People get away from their habits and then they don't know what to do. It's very confusing. And that's on all levels, not just the writing like we're talking here once you get organized. One area where we all expect routine is in an essay. But in all writing modes, not just in an essay, there is some kind of organization pattern, just as there is in every architectural structure. I want to make sure you guys realize that that's the key, you know. I talked about it in other classes before. Like, let's say, I'm comparing it to, let's say, a person who's a stand-up comic, you know, so... The stand-up comic is there and saying all these jokes one after the other. And it sounds like, um, you know, he can just whip them out of his mind anytime he wants and there's no structure. But you'd be surprised. These guys, just like writing an essay, they have to write a skeleton and a structure. And believe me, they know all their jokes from the beginning jokes to the middle to the end. So it sounds like it's just free-for-all or as my DJ friends used to say, freestyle frenzy, but uh, it's all very structured. You know, the same thing, you might read a good piece of literature or an essay and go, wow, this guy must have flowed from the beginning to the end. And it's like, you put it together. And then that's when it sounds like it actually doesn't have an organization. But that's the most important, okay? So to continue from the bottom here, the routine organization of a piece creates a framework that guides the reader through your excellent ideas. We all have excellent ideas, forget that. Of course, you can find examples of writers who twist their writing in unexpected ways, but those are exceptions that are difficult to pull off effectively. Yes, again, there can be some people that can do things instinctively or off the top of their head, but that's not how you should learn. Since you are beginning writing now in college, you got to follow the structure. And when you get a structure and a style, you've written long enough, then maybe you can do something like that. 
okay? But this is very helpful stuff. Uh, continuing, and you often find them in creative modes rather than the research-like modes. In general, you'll find using an accepted organizational format, not only useful for the reader, but satisfying for you as the structure will lend strength to your ideas. Because again, you wanna have this free flow of ideas, but you can get lost in that. But if you know you're filling out a template or what they say here is an organizational format, you can kind of move it along and know that you're on pace, very helpful. Why is organization important? Didn't I just say? <laughs> Readers expect it. It helps make your ideas clearer. It shows you're credible and believable. It shows you know how to organize so you know what you're doing. It helps the flow of your writing, removing reading stumbling blocks. So again, I think I've mentioned it before. You want your ideas clear and you want them organized. You don't want to drift. If your uh, paper or your essay is about writing uh, about the many different kinds of hamburgers in Los Angeles, in the middle of your paper, don't drift into hot dogs, okay? They're not gonna keep you as credible. Your ideas are getting switched. You're coming off the topic, right? And that's gonna stop the flow. Even if you're going to talk about a good chili dog, the paper is about hamburgers. So getting started with organization. So how do you get started? First, consider the overall structure of any piece of writing. And again, breaking the structure down is very helpful. So you have introduction. Then your body paragraphs, which should be three. Unless you have a lot to say, then it'll be four, but you can get away with three. And a conclusion, you always have to have a conclusion. Think of it like a summary. Okay, so that is the basic idea. Uh, let's look at organization more carefully using the example of an essay as our mode or way of doing it. Keep in mind as you go through this section that if we were writing a novel, oh, that's, that's tough, or a movie review, easier, or a manual for work, like a how-to, or an epic poem, there would be different expectations in many ways. But for the most part, the organizational ideas below go for all modes and genres of writing. So you can fit them in all your writing, no matter how small or limited or how wide. The most basic essay format is the five paragraph essay. You can do a five, you'll probably get an A. Like I said, you can get away with three, a lot of people do four. But five, ooh, better be strong. It looks like this, your introduction. Okay, they're gonna credit the first part as introduction. Body paragraph one. Body paragraph two, and body paragraph three, and then your conclusion. If I read that right, that was not five, but like I said, four. Uh, note that the introduction is an inverted triangle, means upside down, because traditionally introductions began broadly and moved to more specific information, ending with the very specific thesis statement or what your paper is about. The conclusion then goes from the specific essay idea to broader generalizations about the topic. Okay, we're in the middle now. You may have learned about the five paragraph essay in school before, and you might be comfortable with it too. That's great. Now, it's time to expand on this to create essays of more than five paragraphs. Some essays like essay questions in a history exam might only require two paragraphs, while a research paper might require 20 paragraphs. In general though, 
all essays will follow the introduction, body, conclusion structure. But introductions and conclusions may be more than one paragraph, and you may have more than three body paragraphs. Okay, so they're telling you that the body, um, excuse me, the conclusion, the intro could be longer than what you expect. Okay, grab a water really quick. Yeah, I'm back. I went all the way to Vegas for that water. Okay, ways to organize. You have several options for organizing your ideas. Chronological order, which is like one, two, three, four, five. Spatial order or order of importance. Some people write the most important thing first, which is different than writing it last, as most people do. So let's get into chronological order first. Chronological or time order is used when relating to events in which time plays a crucial role. This is the easiest of the organizational structures because it's one we've used as humans since we started telling each other stories. The famous or infamous once upon a time it's used all the time in the working world too. For example, in healthcare, charting will often use chronological order to explain when things happen. This is a great structure to use when time is of the essence or important. The same is true for a police report to take another example. So again, this is the old step, the first step, the second step, the third step and on. Okay, most common and safest way of writing things. Okay, at the bottom, if it matters when things happen or you're directing a reader how to do something, putting things in chronological order makes sense. For example, you might write an essay about Google if you're talking about how it became the most popular search engine, you would utilize chronological order to describe its ascent or going upward and success to domination of the market. Spatial order. Oh yeah, spatial order. Um, spatial order or space order, often used when you're describing. This one is also easy when, because when you deploy it or use it, you act like a video camera describing from right to left or vice versa, or from the top to the bottom or vice versa. In the working world, civil engineers, for example, would often find spatial order to be extremely important when looking at road design plans. Sometimes description is the major role of an essay, but more frequently you use description within a single paragraph and will then consider spatial order for that segment only. An example might be describing a tree house you had as a child, or it could be describing the scene of an accident. Right, we go into order of importance. Now, order of importance is the most common organizational structure, but it can be tricky. You can look at it in several ways. One, general to specific, commonly called deduction. Moving from general ideas to more specific ones, that's the most common. Many people, you know, many people like chocolate, or most people like chocolate. And then you can go into more specific ones like uh, chocolate mocha, dark chocolate, chocolate with nuts, things like that, more specific. Next, it's specific to general, commonly called induction. 
moving from specific ideas to more general ones. So you just reverse the one I just told you. We talk about specific things and then just move to generality. Next, most to least critical. Making your strongest point first and then bringing up less critical ideas. A lot of times I've brought up somebody writing a speech about, uh, let's say, the dangers of smoking, right? And they'll usually make the, their, their most strongest point first and say, uh, one out of three people will die of cigarette cancer, you know, unless they stop smoking, right? So they get you right away. They don't say, well, they don't start with the less specific ones and say, if you smoke a lot, you'll get more wrinkles or your nails will turn yellow or, you know, yada, 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 as they say. It'll start right away. You're going to die. You're going to be the one of three. Okay? And then least to most critical, bringing up less critical points early on to build into the most important of all. So that would be the reverse of what I just told you. You kind of go in the soft way. You know, if you keep on smoking, you're going to get more wrinkles. You know, and they, maybe they're telling that to beautiful women so that they'll be worried about stopping. But then they might say, oh, I don't care if I get a few wrinkles. Uh, okay. Uh, smoking might cause, because of the heat, might cause some vision problems. That's okay. I like to wear glasses. Okay. And then they'll, at the end, say, well, if you smoke for over 10 years, you're at a 70% chance of getting lung cancer. So they'll leave the heavy part to the last. Right. Organization between paragraphs. Okay. So within, within. Now that you've decided how you're going to organize your essay as a whole, you're going to start working on getting your points on the page. How are you going to make sure your ideas flow both within your paragraphs and when moving from paragraph to paragraph. First, note that just as an essay starts with an introduction, moves into the body, and then has a conclusion, paragraphs reflect that same structure. So that's good to remember. You just kind of think, I'll do it the same way. Just it will be a total of two times which is cool because you don't want to do it, say the intro and the body and conclusion have one way. And then the paragraphs have a total completely different way, like in mathematics, then you're like, oh, I got to remember six steps now. All right. So first is topic sentence then the body, then the concluding sentence. I think you know where that goes. The topic sentence, like the thesis statement is an essay, gives an overview of the paragraph. The body sentences support the topic with transitions, working with them to help the ideas flow. Then the concluding sentence wraps, helps wrap up ideas and or transition. And the paragraph that follows transitions are important, so don't skip those. And here we go. Here's a chart with some common transitional words and phrases, okay? Transitions that show sequence or time, after, meanwhile, first, second, third, before, as soon as, soon, later, finally, at last, afterward, next, in the first place, before long, at first, then, then we have transitions that show position above, below, next to, across, beside, opposite, at the bottom, beyond, to the left, to the right, to the side, at the top, Inside, under, behind, near, and where. Next, transitions that show a conclusion. Indeed, in the final analysis, 
Hence, oh boy, nobody uses hence anymore. Therefore, therefore, all the people love chocolate, right? These are transitions that show a conclusion. In conclusion, or thus, okay, transitions that continue a line of thought. Consequently, so it's like just, yeah, yeah, right, concluding and, uh, right? Besides the fact, in the same way, furthermore, Following this idea, moreover, additionally, further, considering, it is clear that, because, in addition, looking beyond. Next, transitions that change a line of thought. What? I love you, but you have no money, right? Nevertheless, yet, on the contrary, but on the contrary, you're very handsome. Uh, however, on the other hand, next transitions that show importance above all. More important, or they probably say more importantly, best, most important, especially most, in fact, and worst. Next, transitions that introduce the final thoughts in a paragraph or essay. Finally, most of all, last, least of all, in conclusion, last of all, Last of all, I'll never marry a man that has no money. But what if he's a handsome homeless man? Oh, okay. All purpose transitions to open paragraphs or to connect ideas inside paragraphs. Admittedly, generally, remember all purpose, right? Speaking, oh, obviously, at this point, in general, of course, certainly, in this situation, to be sure, granted, no doubt, undoubtedly, it is true. No one denies, but that's pretty uh, all purpose. Nobody, unquestionably, nobody has a question against that, right? And then transitions that introduce examples, for instance, or that's pretty easy, for example. You want to transition that example? For example. Next, transitions that clarify the order of events or steps. First, second, and third. In the first place. Furthermore, finally, generally, furthermore, finally, in the first place, likewise. Lastly, in the first place, also, last. Where's my arrow? Here we go. Here we go. The greatest involvement device. Unlike anything else, literature involves the reader in the story. How? There are no joysticks to manipulate, no surround sound to engulf you. Your imagination is your only involvement device. But it far surpasses any high-tech computer gimmick. Your imagination makes reading the ultimate adventure. It allows you to immerse yourself in the story, identifying with the protagonist, fighting his battles, experience his fears, sharing his victories. You may become so involved, you end up staying well past your bedtime, turning page after page late into the night. Your imagination is the vehicle that allows you to explore a million different lives. From floating down the Mississippi River on a raft to suffering through a star-crossed love affair. Oh dear, star-crossed love affair. Are the stars really crossed? Or having tea with the March Hare, the Mad Hatter, as our Alice did. Which Alice? Well, not Alice from University of the East, but 
Alice in Wonderland, which could be the same thing. Okay, creative mind writing may be serious or humorous or sublime or all three. Uh, it is often subtle. Meanings are elusive and delicate. Such writing, when done effectively, evokes or brings forth emotion or responses. You get angry. You shed a tear. I'm so sad. They ran out of cheese at McDonald's. You chuckle. Chuckle is a <laughs> kind of laughter. An author's expression strikes a chord that moves you. You and the author communicate on a level that is far beyond an exchange of facts and information. Assuming that I have converted all you literature skeptics to avid library loiterers, people that hang around the library too much, and even if I haven't, I'll offer some advice to help you begin your journey to literary appreciation. It begins with understanding the basic roadmap. Again, sounds like a structure. Which reading method? Pleasure? We read for pleasure or critical? Criticize or understand? Well, I certainly encourage you to approach your reading with the enthusiasm and anticipation that will justify the pleasure reading method. I forget chapter two. The demands of the teacher who assigns the reading will probably require the critical reading method. Reading literature requires most of the skills we've discussed previously. There are devices and clues to ferret out or find out what will help you follow the story and understand its meaning better. You will analyze and interpret what the author is saying and evaluate its work. That's where the criticization comes in. But in addition, in literature, you will be able to appreciate the words themselves. In textbooks, you often must penetrate a thick jungle of tangled sentences, not vines, and murky, which means hard to see, paragraphs to find the information you see. It's not that you can't read it, it's murky in the meaning for you to understand. What is the writer actually trying to say here? That's why they call it uh, murky. Great literature is its language. It's the flow and ebb of its words the cadence or rhythm of its sentences as much as it is story and theme. As you read more, you'll uncover the diversity of tapestries, we'll just say colors, that different authors weave with words. You may discover similar themes coursing through the works of authors like Ernest Hemingway or Thomas Hardy. But their use of language is as different as desert and forest. The composition of the words themselves is an element you'll want to examine as you read literature critically. If you've got all that. Okay, fiction, just another word for storytelling. Most fiction is an attempt to tell a story. Here is a beginning in which the characters and the setting are introduced. There is a conflict or struggle in the middle paragraph that advances the story to a climax, the end, where the conflict is resolved. A final denouement or winding up clarifies the conclusion of the story, the summary. Your literature class will address all of these parts using literary terms that are often more confusing than helpful. Well, not always. The following are brief definitions of some of the more important ones. Number one, plot, the order or sequence of the story, how it proceeds from the opening through the climax. Your ability to understand and appreciate literature depends upon how well you follow the plot or the story, what is known as the story. Characterization. 
personalities or characters central to the story, the heroes, heroines, and villains. You will want to identify the main characters of the story and their relationships to the struggle or conflict. Theme, the controlling message or subject of the story. The moral or idea that the author is using the plot and characters to communicate. And that's what they do. They're trying to communicate their message through the plot and the characters. Some examples, man's inhumanity to man. That means man does just terrible, unspeakable things to other men and women and children, you name it. Man's impotency, which means no power in his environment. Right? What can you do against a storm? Right? Especially out at sea, you have no power. The corrupting influence of power, greed, and unrequited love. Uh, that's what they see. A lot of people say, well, you know, people will show their true colors. This and that. Well, they'll really show their true colors when they get power. And you really see because they're capable of doing anything. And then greed makes people do bad things. And then unrequited love means you love someone and they do not love you back or they reject you in a very bad way. That makes uh, some people want to have some really bad revenge. So... These are examples of humanity to man. Just as with nonfiction, you need to discern or understand this theme to really understand what it is the author wants to communicate. Again, we're always trying to go after what is the author trying to communicate. And the setting of the story, the time and place in which the story takes place, this is especially important when reading a historical novel or one that takes you to another culture. Right, so it has to give you a time frame. Right, are we talking World War II? Are we talking Middle Ages? Right, ancient China. What are we talking about? Next point of view: Who is telling the story? It is one of the central characters giving you flashbacks, or a first-person perspective? So the flashbacks, a person's talking in the past. I remember when I was a young man and I was chased by three bears and I was faster than they were, you know, things like that. Are we talking about a first person perspective? Or is it a third person narrator offering commentary and observations on the characters, the setting and the plot? This person moves the story along and gives it an overall tone. So that's the person talking about other people. Right? Well, Jim and Jane met at high school and then they went, started dating at the local malt shop. And then they went to prom night and fell in love and got promised and what have you. So that's a person talking about characters and story. The first step in reading literature is to familiarize yourself with these concepts. And then try to recognize them in each novel or short story you read. The second step is the same as for reading nonfiction, to identify your purpose for reading. Don't forget that. Identify your purpose for reading. Right? Is it pleasure? Is it to be critical? Allow your purpose to define how you will read. If you are reading to be entertained, then a pleasure read is the way to go. That's all you want out of it. Go for it. It's kind of like you want to see a deep movie that makes you really think, or do you want to see some kind of escapist action movie, like I guess the latest uh, Indiana Jones. There's not going to be a lot of thinking involved there. You want the action to move the story along. If you're reading for a class and will be required to participate in discussions or be tested on the material, you'll want to do a critical read. There you go. Question most students have. How long will it, should it take? As a general rule, fiction is not meant to be read over a period of months or even weeks. Try to read an assigned book or story as quickly as possible fast enough to progress through the plot, 
get a sense of characters and their struggle and hear the author's message or theme. It's helpful not to set a goal as to when you want to finish your reading. So listen to that. It's helpful not to do that. That you'll start getting nervous and sweating. I'm not reading fast enough. You still want the enjoyment fact. Frequently, of course, this will lead, this will already be set for you if your reading is a class assignment. Yeah, they'll tell you you got three weeks to read it. You know. But that's different than you sitting down and saying, well, I want to finish this in six hours. Don't do that to yourself. You should, however, set daily goals. Set aside one or two hours to read or set a goal of reading three chapters a day until you finish. Yes, chop it up into smaller units that you can digest. Reading sporadically, 10 minutes a day, half hour the next, then not picking up the book until several days later means you'll lose track of the plot and characters and just as quickly lose interest. Yes, you will forget, was that Jim or Joe? And the girl was Julie or Janice? It was a story about a dog that had a hamburger or a cat that chased a hot dog, right? You'll forget, so don't do that. Don't do the sporadic stuff. Ah, I said, wow, I went through this faster than I thought. Ooh, do, 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 do. So uh, let's get into the questions. Organizing. The organization of a piece creates what? Yes, what does it create? So again, my funny guys don't say, it creates a, it creates a Big Mac combination. No, not at all. To name the three points that form the overall structure of writing. That's easy peasy lemon squeezy there on number two. Three, this is the options you have for organizing your ideas. Again, the more you list, the more points I can give you. Again, I know I still have students who give me one option, but remember, this says, ah, where's my arrow? Here we go. Do, 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 do. Options, okay. There we go. Four, what are the three elements of paragraph structure? There you go. I'm, I'm reading it out for you. There are three elements. I'm going to say ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise. That will not get any points. That's the structure of making a hamburger. Five, list some things that transitions can show. Remember those long lists I wrote you? Just write a few. What can they show? Pick a few individual topics and you'll be fine, okay? All right, next. Now to the reading questions. Reading the literature. What does literature do unlike anything else? Sounds tricky, but that's easy. It's, you know, you look for do unlike anything else, you'll find the answer. Right. Two, reading literature requires you to analyze or slash interpret what? What? The story? The meaning? It is there. It's a two is not a long answer. Three is a little bit longer. Why is great literature its language, right? Or its own? language. Why is that? Four, this is the five most important points of literature. Again, I've given you a lot of, I'm telling you the exact number, so I should make it a lot easier. I'm trying to say, well, of these eight points, which, how many, which ones do I do? I don't know. I'm going to have a breakdown. I need a highball, whiskey highball. So just give me the five most important points of literature. Five. What are the three things you should try to understand when reading fiction? We concentrated on fiction. So again, that also should be easy as pie. Okay. So we finished the reading. Uh, we've gone through the questions for both composition and reading and we should be set 
Again, I cut you a little short here because I know everybody's tired of getting into the groove like three weeks until, uh, or three weeks from our last assignment. So take it easy on you. Okay. So once you see, there's nothing next. So I go back. We are done. So stop share. All right. So again, this assignment is for February 27th on a Monday. And uh, the next time we'll be talking, it will be March of 2023. It feels like to me, it's still the end of December of 2022, but it'll already be the third week. I mean, the uh, third month of the next year. And then before you know it, it'll be the midterm, then we'll have a little break and then we'll be starting um, you know, the spring quarter. So until then, everybody take care and uh, shall see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.